Uh, so um, the next one is uh, Dr. Amal Matu. You guys all know him, right? There he is. From Baltimore. Superstar. To participate, and um, I, I really, really wish I were there. Unfortunately, travel has still been a little bit difficult, and uh, Saturday is my parents' 60th wedding anniversary, and then Sunday is Mother's Day, and I was afraid if I got stuck quarantined in a hotel eating Tim Horton donuts all through the weekend, I would not have a home to come back to. So, uh, so here I am in Baltimore. But again, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, my thanks to Aaron for preceding me. Um, you know, I, I believe that probably the, the two toughest things in all of medicine are taking care of the cardiogenic pulmonary edema patient who's hypotensive with rapid AFib, and number one, and number two, uh, following Aaron in a conference. So um, I will do my best. So I'm going to ask everyone right now to humor me. Just take a deep breath in, deep breath in, and lower your expectations. Okay, thank you. So what we're going to do for the next uh, 20 minutes or so is talk about a couple of topics in emergency cardiology, a couple of new topics in emergency cardiology that I think are very relevant to your practice. And tomorrow we'll do a little bit more emergency cardiology. But with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. We're gonna do some cases here. So case number one, this is a 43 year old woman who comes in with chest pain and diaphoresis. And here's the 12 lead ECG. Now, I think most people look at this and it's, it's a slam dunk. Most people are, are pretty good with this. This is the kind of thing that shows up on the boards and in the textbooks. Uh, no big surprise here. This is an isolated posterior STEMI. And what you see on this 12 lead that gives away the diagnosis of a posterior STEMI is the fact that in V1, V2, V3, you've got some ST segment depression. And in those same leads, you have upright T waves. And then the real easy part of this is that you already have fairly tall R waves. R waves essentially are Q waves like on the back of the heart. So when you're queuing out on the back of the heart, it shows up as big R waves on the normal front 12 lead ECG. And that makes things very easy. The problem is that how long does it take Q waves to develop? Well, it takes at least a few hours for Q waves to start developing and probably a few more hours after that before the Q waves are large. So the posterior STEMI that you're looking at right now is probably a good four, five, six hours out from the onset of symptoms. What would you see if the patient showed up within the first half an hour or an hour of the onset of their posterior isolated posterior STEMI, you're not going to see tall R waves, and it becomes a lot more difficult. And the result is that posterior STEMIs oftentimes either are missed or there's a significant delay with diagnosis. In fact, from the cardiology literature, there's multiple articles that say, number one, posterior STEMI is the most commonly missed type of STEMI, and number two, only 30% of posterior STEMIs actually get revascularized, meaning cath or lytics, within 90 minutes, and that's terrible. We can't have posterior STEMIs or any type of STEMI that is associated with such a, a frequent and tremendous delay, and posterior STEMIs are, are not uncommon. Now, normally, we get away with not really knowing that much about picking up early posterior STEMIs because usually posterior STEMIs occur in the presence of an inferior STEMI, and everyone's okay with that. I mean, you can pick up an, an inferior posterior STEMI by just picking up the inferior part. But the problem here is that about four or 5% of all STEMIs are isolated posterior STEMIs. And so if you don't know how to pick up an isolated posterior STEMI, you're missing one out of every 20 to 25 STEMIs, which is just not acceptable. And those patients have an increase in morbidity and mortality. So this is something that we've got to pick up on. So here's an example of an inferior posterior STEMI. No one's going to miss this. And no one's going to miss this because you've already got tombstones in the inferior leads. So if that's all you know, you're going to do everything right. You're going to give them lytics or you're going to send them to the cath lab, no problem. But this is actually an inferior posterior STEMI. How do you know that there's posterior extension? Again, your money leads are V1, V2, maybe V3. You see some ST segment depression and there's upright T waves and relatively tall R waves. This is still relatively early. And if you got a 12 lead on this patient in a few hours, as we did here, you'll, well, um, 
if you get a repeat 12 lead in a few hours, you're going to see these R waves get taller and it becomes very easy. As you see here, this is a very easy to diagnose isolated posterior STEMI. Again, you don't have any inferior leads to help you out in this case. This is an isolated posterior STEMI. But again, this is an easy one because there's in V1, V2, V3, there's ST depression. In V1, V2, V3, you've got upright T waves. That's kind of somewhat helpful. But most importantly here, you've got these giant R waves. So you already know this person has developed cues on the back of their heart. Again, what happens if the patient shows up really early? So take a look at this one. Look at this. Once again, V1, V2, V3, you've got ST depression. V1, V2, V3, the T waves are upright, and that's kind of plus minus. But, you know, you don't have tall R waves yet. This patient showed up about an hour after the symptoms developed. And so when you look at this, it's possible this is an early posterior STEMI, but it's also possible that this is anteroceptal ischemia. Not a big deal, right? Well, relatively speaking, not a big deal. And making the distinction between anteroceptal ischemia versus posterior STEMI is really huge. What do you do with anteroceptal ischemia? Well, you give them aspirin and nitro and maybe heparin and you admit them. And if it was two o'clock in the morning, you just admit them. And then cardiology can come in later in the day and see the patient, no big deal with anteroceptal ischemia. But if this turned out to be a posterior STEMI at two o'clock in the morning, you're activating the cast team. They're coming in at two o'clock in the morning or you're giving TPA to this patient at two o'clock in the morning. So there's a big difference between diagnosing anteroceptal ischemia versus posterior STEMI. So you've got to know how to tell the difference. Well, one thing that you could do, you could just wait. Let's just wait a few hours, let the patient continue being ischemic. And if it's a posterior STEMI, these R waves will get taller and, and then we'll know. Well, you know, we don't want to just do that. We don't want to sit on a posterior STEMI just to see if their R waves are going to get bigger. The other thing that you can do is to do posterior leads. Now, Aaron was kind enough to send me a selfie, and this is your normal lead placement, all right? V1, V2, V3, 4, 5, 6. When you want to do posterior leads, what you can do is keep all the leads the same except for uh, just take a couple of these leads and put them in the patient's left mid-back area. We usually just take two leads in this diagram. They put three leads left mid-back area. There's no exact location. Just, just left mid-back is all I tell people, under the tip of the scapula. And now you've got leads that are looking right at the back of the heart. So if you want to know if the patient's having a posterior STEMI, you can just do posterior leads. Well, the problem here, and, and then on those posterior leads, what you're going to do is if you see a half millimeter of ST elevation, you're done. That's a posterior STEMI. So all you need to see on those posterior leads is a half millimeter or more of ST elevation, and you just diagnosed a posterior STEMI, and it's not anteroceptal ischemia. How easy is that? Well, uh, this, this patient did, in fact, turn out to have a posterior STEMI. Well, the problem here is that how, how many of you know that your colleagues in techs routinely do posterior leads? It's not that common. I've been preaching this for years. Other people have been preaching this for years. Whenever you suspect posterior STEMI, whenever you see ST depression, V1, V2, V3, just do posterior leads. You might pick up the posterior STEMI. The problem here is that it's very rarely done. Someone actually studied this and found that, you know, out of, it was some ridiculously low number, one out of a thousand patients, one out of a thousand, less than 1% of patients got posterior leads when indicated. It probably wasn't that bad, but it's really bad, even though we should be doing it. Well, along came this study that I want to talk about by Pendle Myers and a bunch of colleagues. And what they said was, well, if people aren't doing posterior leads, is there some way that we can identify posterior STEMI on the normal 12 lead with really good reliability without the posterior leads, right? And what they found was that if somebody has ST depression in the anterior leads, V1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, if somebody has anterior lead ST depression, but the, the lead that has the maximum ST depression is this ST depression, it's not chlamydia, okay? If somebody has maximum amount of ST depression in V1, 2, 3, or 4, not V5 or V6, but if the maximum amount of ST depression is in one of these leads, and there's no other good reason for ST depression, like say a right bundle or hypo K, something else like that, then it, there was a 97% likelihood 
that you're looking at a posterior STEMI, go ahead and activate the cath lab. So once again, if there's ST, if somebody comes in with concerning symptoms and there's ST depression in your anterior leads, but the lead that has the most ST depression is either V1, 2, 3, or 4, then there's a 97% likelihood then that patient has an acute coronary occlusion or what some people refer to as an occlusive myocardial infarction. Give them TPA, activate the cath lab, all right? Now, this is a first study. There's gonna need to be validation, it's retrospective, but the study was really, really well done. And we'll, we'll look at some more examples. Take a look at this. Here's a patient coming in with chest pain. It's early, so there's no tall R waves. And you'll notice that the lead that has the most ST depression is probably V3 or V4. And so that all by itself tells you 97% likelihood this is a posterior STEMI. Well, we did some posterior leads, and sure enough, in the posterior leads, there was ST elevation that guaranteed that this was a posterior STEMI. How about this one? Take a look at this. This is more subtle, but the lead that has the maximum amount of ST depression, I think, is probably V3. So we're done. This is a posterior STEMI with 97% likelihood just to be safe, we did posterior leads, and there's a half millimeter of elevation in your posterior leads, right? Again, this study suggests maybe you don't need to do those posterior leads. I'm still a big fan of posterior leads. Here's a pre-hospital study where, once again, the ECG lead that has the most ST depression probably is V3, maybe V4, and so we're done. This is a posterior STEMI. This paramedic actually did posterior leads, and you can see that the posterior leads were clearly elevated consistent with posterior STEMI. And then take a look at this one. This patient has subtle ST depression. He's got some chest pain and the lead that has the maximum ST segment out depression is probably V3 again. And so based on that and this study, cath lab is activated and this patient ended up having 100% left circumflex occlusion in a posterior STEMI. So again, this is a very, very nice study to keep in mind, to share with your cardiologist, and it very strongly suggests that if you have a patient coming in with ST depression in your anterior leads, and the lead that has the maximum depression is V1, V2, V3, or V4, that's not anterior septal ischemia, that is a posterior STEMI. If you want to do posterior leads to confirm it, I'm in favor of that, but if your techs don't like doing posterior leads or they're fussing about it, you might not need to, based on the study, you're done. That's a posterior STEMI, all right? So take a look at, at your anterior leads, and again, 97% likelihood is an isolated posterior STEMI. Okay, case number two. I put this in here because it's a little bit of a pet peeve. This is a real case, a 45-year-old man. Perhaps many of you can relate to this. 45-year-old guy comes in with palpitations. He's a bit anxious, just palpitations. It started four hours ago. He's got a couple of risk factors. His vital signs, aside from that heart rate, are pretty good. He's a little anxious and tachypnic. Blood pressure is good. And your 12 lead shows a pretty run-of-the-mill SVT. It's narrow. It's regular. There is some ST depression in a bunch of leads. There's elevation in AVR, which we don't like seeing. We've talked about before, and I'll briefly mention this once again. And so what ends up happening with this guy? Well, he's diagnosed with an SVT. He get you know, he tries some vagal maneuvers, they don't work. So then you give AV nodal blockers, take your pick, adenosine, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers. I'm not going to get into that discussion. Whatever's not on shortage, use that. And he converts, and, and the ECG 10, 15 minutes after he converts is completely normal. And he's asymptomatic. He's just sitting there. What do you do with that patient? I actually posted this on Twitter. I wanted to find out what normally gets done amongst the Twitterverse, amongst physicians out there, in your SVT patient who converts? Do you get labs or do you just discharge a patient with nothing? And if you do get labs, do you get a full set of labs? Do you get troponins? Do you only get troponins if there's some specific history? You know, well, it was a bit surprising to me that a lot of people got troponins. There was a lot of people that got labs and troponins were very, very commonly obtained. So what is it that you do? Do you routinely get troponins or, or are you done? You convert them, I'm done, no labs, go home. Follow up with your doctor with cardiology, all right? Well, what happened with this patient, a troponin was sent and then it was signed out to me. It said, Amal, I sent off some troponins, just check the troponin, if it's okay, he can go home. Well, it wasn't okay. 
what ended up happening was that the troponin was 1.7, which is elevated, normal being less than 0.04. So what are you going to do now? You know, I'm ready to send this person home, but the troponin is elevated. So I said, well, let's get a repeat troponin. And the repeat, repeat is just a little bit higher. It's not off the chart, but it's higher. So we have to go ahead and admit this guy, I guess. He gets admitted. Cardiology sees the patient. They say, all right, fine, let's do a, a stress. Stress test is uh, equivocally positive, And that's not uncommon. He goes for a cath, and the cath is completely normal. Troponins peaked at 3.4, which means the stress test was a false positive. The troponins were essentially a positive. And what did they indicate? What did those positive troponins indicate? Did he have an infarction? No, he didn't have an infarction. Essentially, you ask yourself, what's the cost benefit of what we just did? This patient got a bunch of labs. He got a stress test. He got a cath. He got admitted when normally he probably could have gone home. Fortunately, there's no complications from the cath. God forbid he could have ended up with the coronary dissection from the cath and ended up spending the rest of his life on some other medications or had some other complications, but it was an unnecessary procedure. Well, this has been studied, and these are just a few articles I'll share for, with you from the past year, but it, studies go back 10 years that talk about the utility of testing patients that come in with the plain old SVT. And what they consistently say, number one, with regards to the ECG, Troponins often sent because people get scared about the ST changes. So the first key important point, all of these ST depressions and the elevation in AVR in the presence of SVT mean absolutely nothing. They do not correlate with stress tests or cath. They mean nothing. It's something that is very frequent. Electrophysiologically, there's no good explanation, but as long as it goes away after they convert, and they're not having concerning symptoms after they convert, you don't need to do anything with it. This is not the equivalent of a positive stress test. And I've heard people say that before, and it's wrong. This is a normal thing that you see with SVT. Ignore it unless it persists after they convert. So that's the first key point with regards to the 12 week. ST depressions are totally common. By the way, often with a rapid A flutter and rapid A fib, once you get the rate down, if it goes away, you're done but it's very common with supraventricular tachycardia, SVT, rapid A flutter, and rapid A fib, and it means nothing. What about the troponin? Well, studies indicate that troponins are sent anywhere from 35 to 80% of the time in, uh, in studies looking at SVT care in emergency departments, and about a third of the time, the troponins will be a little bit elevated, and the troponin elevations are not associated with any bad outcome. They are associated with admissions, non-invasive tests and invasive diagnostic tests, just the way you saw here, but they are not associated with any adverse outcomes at all. The troponin elevations mean nothing. Essentially, it's just a sign of oxygen supply demand mismatch. If any of you did a couple of laps running around the hotel, you'd probably develop tachycardia and a little oxygen supply demand mismatch, and you might bump your troponin also. Does that mean you're having a heart attack? No. It does not. It doesn't mean anything of concern. It's just a normal thing. So the recommendation that they make, based on all of these studies, and studies going back 10 years, it's very simple. If you're thinking about sending a troponin, that decision should not be based on the signs and symptoms the patient's having during the SVT, and it should not be based on what the EKG looks like during the SVT. Convert the patient back to sinus rhythm, and then go back and do a new history and physical and EKG. And if the patient is having concerning symptoms for ACS after you convert them, then by all means, work them up. If the patient's EKG is looking ugly after you convert them, by all means, feel free to work them up. But your decisions about any workup, troponins, troponin testing and EKGs, and in fact, this also applies to whether you should be getting CBCs on patients, and chemistries on patients and thyroid studies on patients should be based on your history and physical after you convert them back to sinus rhythm. CBC, if, if there's no recent history of GI blood loss, there's no reason the utility of CBC approaches zero. And let's not even talk about the utility of a white count, right? If the patient's not having vomiting or diarrhea, they're not on diuretics, the utility of routinely checking electrolytes approaches zero. If the patient doesn't have 
hot or cold intolerance, thyromegaly, hyperdefecation, things like that. The utility of routinely getting thyroid studies approaches zero. So it comes back to doing a history and physical. Convert the patient back to sinus and then do a new history and physical, NEKG. And if the new history and physical is not concerning for anything, you need to do a nothing workup. You don't need to do anything, but it should be based on after they convert. So quick take home point with this second study as we wrap it up. Troponins and SVT, well, you should test troponins based on their post-conversion signs and symptoms. If they're having substernal pressure after they convert, right? Not during the adenosine, okay. But after they convert, if they're still having chest pressure, diaphoresis, shortness, breath, by all means, work them up for ACS. If the EKG has significant ischemic findings, by all means, work them up for ACS. If they've been having vomiting, diarrhea, GI blood loss, by all means, send off your CBC and electrolytes. But the good news here is that if they convert and they say, doc, I feel fine, thanks so much, you can hand them the discharge papers and tell them, follow up with your primary care doc or see a cardiologist for routine follow-up. And of course, you're going to counsel them, stay away from caffeine, alcohol, nicotine, other sympathomedics, and so on. Do your your good doctor counseling about how to avoid these and also teach them a little bit about vagals. But in terms of the workup, you don't need to do a workup on these patients after afterwards. So with that, we are done with a couple minutes to spare. And uh, again, I, I thank you all very much for your time and attention. And um, I'll, uh, I'll hand it back to our, our MCs. Thanks, Mal. Thanks, Mal. Any questions? If you, you can direct yep. the questions towards me. Yeah, <laughs> he's back, he's back. <laughs> any questions for any, any delayed questions for our previous speakers? Um, there are a couple. Um, you guys, what, if we mic you up a bit, can you answer something? If Arun wants to come back up. Or... Arun? We'll let you go in a minute. All right, so why, why don't we start with Amal? Um, I, oh, I'm almost back. Yeah, okay, he's back, sorry. he's back. <laughs> no, come back up. Come, come on. on, come on back um, up. So, Amal, there was a question about making 15 lead ECGs a standard um, and why we don't actually do that since we're so bad at ordering them in the first place. Has that come up anywhere that we should be doing that on a regular basis? Uh, that question's come up and I would say you probably don't need to do that. First of all, the machines that do 15 leads are separate machines, probably a bit more expensive to buy new machines. And uh, some people said, well, should we routinely do the extra leads on all patients? And, and the answer is no. I, I think probably it's useful to do them only if you see that ST depression in those anteroceptal leads. It's probably useful to get a right-sided set of leads if you see evidence of an inferior STEMI. But in the absence of those two things, in the absence of inferior STEMI, in the absence of ST depression in V1 through V3, then you, you I, I would say that the utility of getting those extra leads approaches zero. So I don't think you need to do that. Perfect. Um, and I guess there is still some confusion about not doing the workup. So we just want to be clear. If someone is having chest pain when they're going at a heart rate of 150, you convert them and they're feeling fine. We are not doing any workup at this point. That's absolutely correct. You, you base your workup on the history and physical post-conversion. Perfect. Um, so I have a question for Arun from before. Um, so basically, um, you have an ankle fracture dislocation, you've splint it, tried to reduce it, and it's inadequate. It's the middle of the night. Are you trying to do it again yourself? When do you call ortho, et cetera? Yeah, so if, if people didn't hear that clearly in the back, it, it basically you try a reduction, a fracture dislocation, a reduction wasn't quite successful, should you try it again? Um, they're generally fairly straightforward to do. Flexing the knee certainly helps. I think I would try it again before I called ortho at three in the morning. Um, certainly if I was fairly remote and hours away from ortho, I would definitely be giving it a second shot um, to try. One of the things is sometimes you obtain the reduction, um, but when you put the splint on, you don't maintain it. And one of the keys in doing that is actually just once you reduce it and you feel like it's clunked in, it's a pretty obvious clunk, just have somebody grab the big toe. And when you grab the big toe, you bring the foot up, you bring the foot in, which is the direction opposite to where it wants to go out. It wants to go out and, and posterior, posterior lateral. So when you grab the big toe, it brings it up and in, and then you just have your supplies ready. 
So you, you don't, don't reduce it, put the leg down, go get your splint, go apply a splint, and then take a post-reduction film. It's not uncommon that it will slip out because it's so unstable. Um, have everything ready, do the reduction, have somebody just hold the big toe, and that, and that will help. And then you've got to do a little bit of a mold to try to hold it in place. And just in terms of that mold, is there anything specific they're asking? If there's yeah, anything specific so it depends splinting. where the fracture goes. So if the fracture is out and we reduced it, the fracture wants to go back out again. So what you'll do is you'll take your proximal hand and put it proximal to the fracture, your distal hand, the direction it wants to go, and you try to bring your hands together. So a molded splint is not a tight splint. A molded splint, there's an offset. So it's not squeezing as hard as you can like this. It's sort of an offset to help. So stabilize the proximal piece and then the distal. So if it just went out lateral, you want to just take the distal piece and direct it medial. If it also went out posterior, your, your outside hand will not only go lateral, but also go posterior. So it's going to pull it up and in, and your other hand is going to be also at 45 degrees, almost like a diagonal. And that's all you do. You just sit there and wait until you feel the heat come off the plaster, um, and just have patience and should work. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Well, uh, we're going to take a break and see you back here at 3.50, please.